Hello everyone, we're here at Parenyatwa General Hospital, which is the biggest central hospital here in Harare, and effectively Zimbabwe. Uh, we've just been talking to some of the doctors in light of the strike action that's to commence tomorrow, which is the 15th of February 2017. Strike action nationwide by the doctors to protest um, against their working conditions, the on-call allowance, um, and various other demands that they're making to the government. How much does it cost? to get admitted to Parinia 12 or to Visa General Hospital or Harare Hospital? Uh, some, some of the charge you 50 something in hundred dollars. So fifty to hundred dollars deposit to get admitted into a, a public hospital. Yes. In order to be admitted at a government hospital, uh, you have to pay a deposit of $100. This doesn't include cannulas, essential resources, gloves, and of course the drugs. You have to pay that in addition to the $100 deposit um, that you'll have to pay up front. And this is obviously gets the background of collapsing medical aid societies. Okay, does this include drugs? No, it doesn't include drugs because if a patient is then... Uh, uh, they will then have to buy their own drugs. If okay, they own and drugs. if they're buying their own drugs, is there a government pharmacy available for them to buy their own drugs? There are government pharmacies are out there, but uh, most of the times they are not uh, fully stocked or they don't have uh, the drugs. Okay, so if the government pharmacies are not fully stocked, where will the citizens get the drugs from? Because I pay my hundred dollars to get admitted and there are no drugs. Where do, where do we then access the drugs? No, I think it is a, a new phenomenon, it's actually a growing phenomenon, where we are finding that uh, most central hospitals and now have uh, private uh, pharmacies in, in our house inside the Okay, so the private pharmacies within the government hospitals, yes. who owns them? We, we are not sure who owns these pharmacies, we are not really sure. You're not sure, but they always fully stocked whereas the government pharmacies these are These are the pharmacies that actually have uh, the drugs most of the time. But you also know that government pharmacies are mostly empty and poorly stocked. But within the location of public hospitals, there are private pharmacies. Nobody knows who owns these pharmacies, but they're always stocked with essential medication. Okay, uh, in addition to drugs, we all know that when we try and access medical care, drugs are not the only thing that's required. Sometimes you need a drip, sometimes you need a cannula, sometimes you need, you know, the doctor needs gloves. Are these basic resources available? I would say it's actually uh, very much frustrating sometimes when you want to uh, yeah, help a patient. The patient comes, uh, most of the time you then have to rely on the relatives to go and buy those things. For, for instance, if it is an emergency, then you want to insert a kind of, you want to put a patient in a drip, you know, you, you can only wait until they are able to buy or if someone comes with the money to buy those things. So you're saying that in most instances, the government hospitals don't even have a cannula and the patient, him or herself, has to go and buy his or her that is, cannula. That is the case most of the time. Okay, that's quite distressing. Did you know that a doctor earns a dollar twenty per hour when they're on call? Did you also know that one pint of blood costs one hundred and thirty dollars, which means that a doctor would have to work more than a hundred hours in order to afford um, a pint of blood on call? Let's talk about blood. What is the cost of blood in a public hospital? Um, the cost of blood, uh, usually, I think they, they mostly use the uh, blood product is uh, the pig cells, okay. which cost about $130 per pint. $130. Okay, so we've paid $100, the deposit, then one pint of blood is $130. For an accident, say two cars and you're bleeding, how many, roughly how many pints of blood would that require? That largely depends on the amount of blood that you have most of the time. Uh, well, not only really, maybe someone uh, would need two or three pints of blood. Two or three pints. So we're looking at over three hundred dollars plus the consultation. It comes to five hundred, and this doesn't even include drugs, gloves, and cannulas. And so, if you don't have medical aid and you don't have cash, is there any facility where public health uh, hospitals or public hospitals can uh, attend to patients in an emergency? Sometimes they, they, do, they do try to help, but you know, most of the times they excuse, or uh, whether it's a reality, we don't know, but they excuse that there is nothing to, to offer the patient something. So if you want to help a patient and it's an emergency, uh, we largely rely on uh, you know, uh, cash from our relatives. So we have to wait until they can sort themselves. Uh, they can and if they don't have the cash, then it's then that's too bad. Isn't it's it? too bad for a patient. Yeah. Right. Now let's talk a little bit about doctors' working conditions, okay? Would you describe our hospitals as overcrowded, our general hospitals, the public ones? Yes, uh, the, the, the hospitals are overcrowded. 
uh, especially considering the number of uh, you know, doctors that are present in these hospitals. You know, they, are, they are working flat out to try and assist patients, but you know, the numbers are, are changing. Do we have enough doctors? We do not have enough doctors. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, would you say, we all know that we've got a water crisis throughout Harare and throughout Zimbabwe. Is this affecting the public health system? It is affecting in a big way because, uh, you know, this means that uh, if the water supply is, is erratic like it is right now, it means, you know, the, the general hygiene service is, uh, is compromised. And there's are there sometimes water. water cuts at these public hospitals? They are. They sometimes they do. Okay. That's disturbing. Um, let's talk about doctors on call. Doctors have to, uh, junior doctors have to go on call. Can you just briefly describe what being on call means? Usually being on call means uh, that uh, you know you are standing in to cover any sort of emergencies, sort of uh, yeah, whether patients are coming in or patients are already admitted. So you have to be there to make sure that uh, whenever there's an emergency, there's a doctor to attend. So when patients are coming uh, to be seen during the night, uh, a doctor is there to see those patients and uh, make sure that uh, everything is, uh, is So it's basically a nighttime shift? Yeah, just a nighttime shift. How long is it? Um, most of the times people go for, you know, uh, more than 8 hours, more uh, than 12 eight hours, hours sometimes. 8 to 12 hours. Well, sometimes you cover a call from uh, 4 p.m. until 6 in the morning. Okay, so 4 p.m. to 6 <coughs> yeah. in the morning. Okay, so that's 12 hours working on call at night. Now tell me, how much are doctors pay per hour to work between 4 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning? Uh, there's, there is a flat figure in terms of on call allowance which is a 288 dollars. So if you reduce that to... Uh, this is 228 per month, is it? Yeah, 288 dollars per month. 288 per month. Figure. But if you reduce that to... An hourly an rate. Hour of it, then it comes out to a dollar twenty per hour. So doctors are working for a dollar twenty to be on call. Yes. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about doctors that are training, doctors that are interns and so on. Okay. Um, what is what are their working conditions like? I think the the, the working conditions largely is uh, it's it's a reflection of the, the public health system right now. We you know they have to you know they have the skills to help patients, but sometimes you can't help because the patients themselves can't afford to buy their own cannulas. Patients can't afford to buy their own drips. So you know you have. So is their training compromised as a result? I would say to a certain extent they are, but in terms of their training, I think it's quite sufficient. It's sufficient, but they don't have the resources to implement what they've learned. Okay, now what's one of the big demands um, around interns? What's we've heard in the newspapers that you know there's some problems with interns? Can you just share some light on that? And yes, there, there are some demands. Uh, largely, we have three main issues that we wanted to, to the government to address. Okay, so let's just put these demands into context. Yes. I think it's been widely reported in the press that come tomorrow, the 15th of February, doctors are going on strike. Is the strike action going to go ahead? Yes, it's going ahead. Okay, yes. and what are your three major demands? The three main uh, major demands, the first one being that uh, uh, in general, if a, a doctor finishes from a medical school, they're supposed to work for two years uh, as an intern, and then after that, they're supposed to uh, they can either go and work in the district hospital or still remain in the uh, central hospitals right. for another year. And then after that, that's when they are given an open, open practice certificate to, to sort of uh, start their own thing or are able now to go and work in the private. Okay, so what's the government saying about that now? Once you've finished your two years of internship, what happens to a doctor? It sounds after, like after they're not the, guaranteed any employment that, from what That is saying. the situation and this is the, the reason why we are making these demands because they're saying after two years they are no longer able to accommodate the doctors in Why are they able to accommodate you? Are they suggesting it's a money issue? It's a money issue. They are, they are saying we have a lot of limited uh, fiscal space. That there's no a money. money treasure, in, yeah, the treasure doesn't have money for that. Okay, so what do they expect a doctor who's finished two years of internship to go and to go and sit at home? This is a challenge, so uh, that's why we're saying if they can't employ doctors, then they, they should give them their open practice certificate, then they can you know, select options to see. And I see, so you actually, as one of your demands, you're presenting a solution. In other words, okay, if you say you don't have money, at least grant us the open practicing certificate so that we can go and exercise our skills elsewhere. That's exactly okay, that's okay. Demand. that's demand number one. What's demand number two? Demand number two is that uh, we want, uh, uh, this was agreed upon in 2015 when doctors went on strike. 
uh, that uh, the minimum you know, on the call allowance was going to be 720 per month. And okay. the bare minimum. Right. So, uh, so 720 per month makes it roughly how much per hour? Because I think that helps to bring it into context. It makes it around $10 per hour. So $10 hour. per hour. Okay, currently you said it's $1.20. Wow. So you have to work 100 hours to buy a pint of blood on call. Right. Just to put things in context. Say, okay, that's staggering dark. But anyway, let's move on to your third demand. What's your third demand? The third demand is that we, we, we want the government to subsidize. We want, we want to buy cars. We want to buy our cars. We're not asking the government to buy Okay, cars. so there has been this, this slight controversy uh, where it's the perception has been created that doc doctors are expecting the government to buy it cars. Is that perception correct? And could you place it into its proper context for us? If you that's, don't mind? that's not correct. Because what we are saying is that we want to buy our own cars, but we want the government to subsidize in, in terms of paying the duty to Zimbabwe. Okay, so all you want is a tax incentive. Yes. Okay, so the cars you'll pay for yourselves and all you want is the government to make. If they're saying they don't have the money, surely they've got the power to yes. grant a tax incentive. And then we believe that's a, you know, a sense for, you know, sort of an incentive to make sure that they retain these uh, okay. hardworking cars. So again, it's, it's a solution-based demand. You're not just demanding the fact that you don't have transport, but you're presenting something. Of a solution. Doctors are greedy, they just want money. How can they go on strike and allow patients to die? What would your reaction to such a comment be? I, I would say, you know, I think, in my own opinion, that uh, I think the Zimbabwean doctors are, are amongst the most people who are very patriotic in the actual life of this country. Because, you know, you can imagine when you're working with all these things that we're discussing about right now, and you don't have anything to, you know, to sort of try and help patients. You know, but they have been there, they've tried their best, they've been working flat out, when they are any dollar twenty on per hour oh, on call. You can imagine. They can you know, really get you paid of yes. service. So these people are very patriotic, they love yes. this country. I mean, we remain committed to serving the community. This is the reason why we say, you know, the government in the in the first place has to provide for you know for employment of doctors for potential. Yes. We are not saying we all want to work in the government hospitals, we do want to work in there. But the challenge is that the government is saying it's no longer able to work. No, accommodate us. And yet there's a shortage of doctors. And yet there's a huge shortage because, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the doctor to patient ratio, we have, I think, one of the most lousy, you know, ratio. I think one of the doctors. important statistics in that regard is that for every one doctor in Zimbabwe, we've got 250,000. You can imagine um, Yeah. You know, and, you know, so the doctors are very patient. Right. They want so. to serve, but they, they can only do so in reasonable Condition. So one of the things that seems to hold a lot of people back in making demands against the government is fear of intimidation, being threatened, being harassed. You know, is this something that those who are leading the strike action by the doctors, you know, actually fear? Yes, there is that fear that, uh, some, you know, every time this happens, we, we have our leaders being, you know, victimized, some of them being suspended. But we know, we, 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 what we feel is that we are making reasonable demands. We are okay. not trying to, you know, subvert anything, but we just want to make, you know, our service of conditions better for, you know, for the patients. And, and at the end of the day, well. it's only the patients that, that benefit from that. Yes, the patients benefit immensely from this, uh, because, you know, we want to have motivated uh, cutters on, the, on, the, on their posts, so that, you know, you know, the service is better. And uh, is there unity amongst the doctors, especially the more junior ones, that would be, my, you know, maybe more prone to intimidation? There is, there is a lot of unity, uh, mainly because uh, uh, there is support. I think people can see that there is a lot of support, especially from uh, also the senior cadres or consultants. Yeah. And, it's um, important for the senior consultants, and... registrars to support as well, because you know, in order for more people to fill their spots where they go, you need to ensure that the bottom is taken care of. Yes, isn't that's, it? That's true. Obviously, you know, at the end of the day, one of the important things around accountability is for us to go to the authorities, to the Minister of Health. We must ask, we must speak, and we must act. Is there any sort of direct message that you'd like us to, to ask or send to Dr. Parreñatwa consistent with your demands? I think right now, um, what I would say is that, uh, you know, I think the government is in a responsibility to act uh, swiftly in terms of... Uh, resolving these issues because we don't want our patients to be the ones who are suffering because of this. What we want is just to improve our own conditions and then we, we are back at work and uh, improve the service we are delivered to our patients. So the quicker they fix the demands and, you know, adopt your solutions, the quicker you'll go back to work and so, you know, patients won't suffer. 
definitely. Okay, and is there any last message that you'd like to give to the citizens, the people who are basically um, your patients, the people you serve at the end of the day in terms of what you need in support for the strike action? I think what we need is uh, for the public to be here with us. I think um, uh, what we're doing is uh, actually trying to improve um, our own conditions so that you know, we are able to serve them you know, in, a, in a happy and making sure that you know, everyone else is set um, without you know, you know, the doctors uh, being unmotivated, doctors you know, having to use public transport because we want to be there for our patients all the time. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. Cheers.